the novel Beloved begins with the quote, 60 million and more. This is drawn from a number of studies on the African slave trade which estimate that approximately half of each ship's human cargo perished in the transatlantic voyage to America. Toni Morrison had begun thinking about Beloved in 1983, but the inspiration to the story had appeared nearly a decade earlier. Morrison had read an article about an enslaved African-American woman when working as a book editor for Random House. The woman in the article had escaped slavery, but was tracked down and soon found by slave hunters. Facing a return to slavery, the woman killed her two-year-old daughter, but was captured before she could kill her other kids, or herself. It took years for all the elements to fall into place, but when they did, Morrison knew that it was an important story, and one she wanted to tell. Many books prior had placed their focus on the horrors of the physical brutality and used an abstract way of telling how a whole ethnicity was forced to work for barely anything. But Morrison wanted something different. She wanted to explore the thoughts and feelings, the troubles of the slaves themselves. Removing the focus from the white slave owners was also a way to give back some of the power to the circumstances of what so many slaves had been forced to suffer through. Soon she had written the first words of what would become the most well-known novel of her career. You're listening to House of Words, a podcast about writers, authors, and ghosts. I am your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin, and today we're talking about Toni Morrison's Beloved. book that would open the door for many Black American writers, as well as lead to the first Pulitzer Prize awarded to a Black woman of any nationality. The novel was published in September of 1987, and though there are many layers to the story, here is a short synopsis to refresh your memory or entice you to read the book. The novel examines the destructive legacy of slavery as it chronicles the life of a Black woman named Setha from her pre-Civil War days as a slave in Kentucky to her time in Cincinnati, Ohio in 1873. Although Setha lives there in Ohio as a free woman, she is held prisoner by memories of the trauma of her life as a slave. Haunted by the apparition of her dead two-year-old daughter, Setha is forced to face the horrors she encountered and would be forced to endure if she had any hopes to have some semblance of a life. Quote, I tell my students, when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that your real job is that if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. This is not a grab candy game. End quote. Toni Morrison was born Chloe Ardelia Wolford on February 18, 1931 in Lorraine, Ohio, to her parents Ella Rama and George Wolford. She was the second of four children from a working-class black family in 1930s America. Her father George had grown up in Georgia where he had experienced the ugliness that came with segregation and racism which included the lynching of two black businessmen who lived on his street. George was a mere 15 years old at the time. Morrison would later say that her father had never told her nor her sister about seeing the bodies of the lynched men, but he had in fact. The incident was a profoundly traumatic experience. Soon after the lynching, George Wolford managed to get away from Georgia and moved to the radically integrated town of Lorraine, Ohio, in hopes of escaping racism as well as finding a job. George Wolford made it to Ohio, but the haunting cruelty of racism and slavery was deeply ingrained in the Wolford bloodline. Both Tony's great-grandmother and grandfather were born slaves. Her grandfather was five years old when the Emancipation Proclamation was declared. Her great-grandmother survived slavery as well, but not without scars, both physical and psychological. 
Later in life, her grandfather would be very proud of the fact that he had read the entire Bible, cover to cover, and would often speak of this fact. Tony didn't understand why he was so proud of this until she learned that it was the only book he had been allowed to read. In his time, it was illegal for whites to teach colored people to read, so it was a revolutionary accomplishment for him. This pride of reading would follow the lineage, and Tony's parents would later take great pride in subscribing to book clubs. When she was about two years old, her family's landlord set fire to the house in which they lived because they hadn't been able to pay the rent. They were at home at the time, but the family responded by laughing at the landlord rather than falling into despair. She later said that her family's response demonstrated how to maintain integrity and claim your own life, even when faced with acts of such monumental crudeness. Tony would learn to read from her sister, Lois, beginning when she was just three years old. They would mark letters and words on the sidewalk by using pebbles. Simple words to begin with, then more complicated ones, which was the beginning of an ever-expanding vocabulary and a love for words. In addition to providing a love for books, her parents also instilled in her a sense of heritage and language through telling traditional Black American folk tales, ghost stories, and singing songs from their past. Among Morrison's favorite authors growing up were Jane Austen and Leo Tolstoy. At age 12, she became a Catholic and took the baptismal name Anthony after Anthony of Padua, which led to her nickname, Tony. A few years later, after graduating from Lorraine High School, she enrolled at Howard University in Washington, D.C., a decision she largely made because she wanted to get away from her mother and get a taste of freedom. Paradoxically, Washington, D.C. would also be the place she first encountered racially segregated restaurants and buses. Graduating from Howard in 1953 with a B.A. in English, she went on to earn a Master's of Arts from Cornell University in 1955. She became a professor, first in English at Texas Southern University in Houston, Texas, and subsequently at her alma mater, Howard University. While teaching at Howard, she met Harold Morrison, a Jamaican architect, whom she married in 1958. Their first son was born in 1961, and she was pregnant with their second son, when she and Harold divorced in 1964. Then one day she would read an ad about a major publisher who was looking for someone with originality and imagination, male or female, with a master's degree. She applied for the job and got it. She was still working for this publisher when Random House acquired it, bringing Morrison along with them. At Random House in New York City, she became their first black female senior editor in the fiction department. Morrison had begun writing fiction as a part of an informal group of poets and writers at Howard University. She attended one meeting one day with a short story about a black girl who longed to have blue eyes. She later developed the story into her debut novel, The Bluest Eye, getting up every morning at 4 a.m. to write while raising two boys on her own. Unbeknownst to anyone at Random House, Morrison published The Bluest Eye through Holt, Reinhardt, and Winston in 1970. She was 39 years old at the time. Random House soon became aware of the novel she had written. And after having read it and becoming impressed with her work, they decided to publish her next novel through Knopf, an arm of Random House. Having had the chance to personally know her grandfather and great-grandmother shaped much of her writing and, one must surmise, her personality as well. Tony was quite impressed that they had managed to survive slavery, but also amazed that they had managed to survive afterwards as well. As stated earlier, Morrison had been inspired by an article concerning a slave, a visit to the slave mother who killed her child was published in an 1856 newspaper article in the American Baptist. The article was reproduced in the Black Book, a compilation of black history and culture that Morrison happened to edit in 1974. 
The article focused on a slave woman named Margaret Garner and the horrifying actions she felt forced to go through with. Margaret Garner was a woman in her 20s when she escaped from slavery in Kentucky in 1855 with her four children. She made it all the way to Cincinnati where she would live with her mother-in-law, who was a preacher. It wouldn't be long, however, before slave catchers became knowledgeable about her whereabouts. When Margaret saw the slave catchers coming towards the house, she ran out to the shed behind the house where she attempted to kill all four of her children, succeeding with only killing one. She hit her boys in the head with a shovel and cut one of the girls' throat, and as she was about to slam her last child against a wall, she was stopped by the slave catchers. The two-year-old girl, cut across the throat, didn't survive. According to Morrison, Margaret Garner did not look crazy in photos, but rather quite the opposite. Based on the article, Margaret had simply decided that her children could not live under the same conditions that she had endured. She could not and would not permit that. It was no life. Ultimately, death would be better than slavery, she decided. To Morrison, it felt like the most extreme act any loving mother could be pushed to, the murder and attempted murder of her children in order to spare them a lifetime of misery that the mother herself knew all too well. Margaret had nothing else other than her children at the time of this drastic decision, a decision that would influence Morrison to write her fifth book. However, she did not want to write the story of Margaret Garner. Rather, she wanted to write the story that the article had inspired her to, the story she imagined in her mind as she read the article. Because of this, Tony did no more research on Margaret Garner until after she finished Beloved. In her writing, she was reluctant to enter the period of slavery, for she knew there would be a need to re-examine and reimagine the atrocities, something she was not looking forward to. She also suspected that no one else would want to dig deeply into the interior lives of slaves, except to summon their nobility or victimhood, to be outraged or self-righteously gripped by pity. She was troubled by these factors but also felt that she had a story that had to be told, a story that was important to get down on paper. The book had to deal with slavery. There was no doubt about that. But there was another element that Morrison wanted to explore as well. A colored woman had to be the center of the narrative, something few had dared to do before then. She also wanted to stay away from the sentiment that most books about slavery are written with the frame of mind that it's being read by a white person, which often meant that a white protagonist or antagonist was at the center of the story. She didn't want her character to be defined by how they acted or behaved only when their oppressors were looking at them, but on the contrary show how much more happened when they weren't looking. How much the slaves lived and experienced as humans being human, acting human, outside of the eyes of the slave owners, was more important and ultimately more interesting. And Toni Morrison had no intentions on censoring herself. If she was to dive into the minds of slaves, she would do so without restrictions. One thing Morrison found both a challenge and a sad fact was how difficult it was to find information about the time period. That may sound surprising because of how much history occurred in the years of slavery, but, predictably, much of the information about that time has been destroyed in order to keep it silent. Even from the survivors of slavery, there seemed to be a deliberate survivalist instinct to forget about the horrors they had experienced. Many former slaves wanted to make a life for themselves, and in order to accomplish that, they felt the need to repress some of the more horrific things they had experienced. There was nearly no reference to the slave ships. There were no songs written down. No stories about the trauma and experience that went on in the thousands of voyages westward. 
What little information there is comes from the slave owners or captains of the ships. This was often done when they were near death and wanted to rid themselves of their guilt and confess to the atrocities they had been a part of. But even then, one can concur that many occurrences and experiences were taken with them to the grave. The language used in the novel was also of great importance to Morrison. She wanted the language to be musical, but not necessarily ornate poetic words. She wanted it to be written in a very simple style, but one that flowed and had a rhythm to it, which is what she considers to have indeed accomplished. Her goals were simple. She wanted to create sentences where the reader would be invited to bring his or her own emotions to the story. In that way, the experience becomes richer as the reader can provide elements to the story that wouldn't have been as strong if brought forth by the writer. Ultimately, she wanted the language to be so clear that when the characters are talking as simultaneously as any characters can in written form, each sentence would be recognizable as being from a certain character, even when not specified. And in that respect, as Morrison saw it, she would create the musical language she had strived towards. Quote, When I have been accused, and a lot of times I have been, of making characters larger than life, I realized that what I had in fact done was simply describe characters who were as large as life. Life is that large. End quote. Writing novels gave Morrison the feeling of being in control. The outside world would do what it does. Some days it would seem okay, other days it would seem less okay. Some days it was beautiful, others not so beautiful. But when she sat down to write, she was in control, and that was the foundation in her need to write. As mentioned earlier, Morrison would write before dawn in her initial years of writing, which had become more a necessity than a predilection. Having small children when she embarked on her first novel, she needed to use the time before they would wake up, meaning she would wake before the sunrise, around 4 a.m., and write until she and the children needed to get ready for school and work. Because she always had a nine-to-five job, she had to write either in between those hours, hurriedly, or spend a lot of time during the weekend and pre-dawn doing so. She would do her mightiest to find this time and would accumulate four novels while still working a full-time job, kids inclusive, proving that her discipline was as staunch as her writing. On the very first day she quit working at Random House at the age of 52, she started on the book that would become beloved. She sat down at the pier outside her house and realized that she was actually happy and free, something she had not felt before. She could take her time. She could write at her own pace. And that's what she did. She also found that the only time she felt like writing was very early in the morning. It was also the only time she felt she was good at writing. The habit of waking up early had been instilled in her since childhood, but the difference, a vital one, was that she was now able to decide to do it. Further establishing this routine was how after lunch, she found that her inspiration began to falter. She would later explain that she did not consider herself very bright, very witty, or very inventive after the sun went down. A part of the morning ritual was making herself a cup of coffee and watching the first light as the sun rose. To her, that was the preparation she needed in order to get into the right headspace. Light was the signal of transaction, and with her being there to witness it, a vital element, consciously or subconsciously, established itself. From her first novel, all the way up to her last, Morrison would always prefer to write the first drafts in pencil on yellow legal pads. She would also make drawings and lists and write out arcs in character development on the pages. Though her preferences were a yellow legal pad and a nice number two pencil, she wasn't so picky and, if need be, 
would write with a ballpoint if there was no pencil at hand. For beloved, she would draw floor plans of the house where the characters lived, with stairs and furniture drawn in, in addition to the aforementioned elements. She did experiment with using a tape recorder once, trying to dictate bits and pieces of a story or a good sentence when it came to her during the workday, but ultimately, it wasn't her thing. The pencil and pad, that's where the inspiration was, and there was little reason to mess with the formula any further. When the first couple drafts were written and she felt she had a good grasp of the story, she would type it into a computer and begin to revise. While revising, she wouldn't read her work out loud, like many authors do. She actually would not read it out loud until after it was published. The reason for this being that she found the most difficult part of writing to be the act of having to write a language that could work on paper when the reader didn't hear it read by her. For this to be accomplished, she stated, one had to work very carefully with what is between the words, including what is not said. She would try, as mentioned earlier, to establish a rhythm to the text, one that was not only present when she would read it out loud, but one that would be present in the language and in the head of the reader when reading. Some writers have a fixed amount of times they rework or edit their work, but Morrison did it for as long as she was able to. Sometimes she would revise six or seven times. She would even go as high as 13 revisions. But she always kept in mind that there's a distinct line between revision and fretting. When something is fretted upon because it is not working, she would discard the paragraph or section or chapter altogether. But lo and behold, despite numerous revisions, she would still find herself fretting over the work after it had been published, which goes to show that complete satisfaction over one's work is rare, if not impossible. Beloved would become a commercial and critical success, remaining on the bestseller list for 25 weeks. Despite overall high acclaim, the book failed to win the prestigious National Book Award or the National Book Critics Circle Award, which encouraged 48 critics and writers, among them Maya Angelou, to protest the omission in a statement that the New York Times published on January 24, 1988. Two months later, Beloved would win the Pulitzer Prize for fiction, and it would also go on to win an Annisfield Wolf Book Award. The book is the first of three novels about love and Black American history, sometimes referred to as the Beloved Trilogy, and Morrison has stated that these books are intended to be read together, explaining, the conceptual connection is the search for the beloved, the part of the self that is you and loves you and is always there for you. After Beloved, she continued writing, and five years later, her sixth novel, Jazz, was released. In 1993, Morrison was awarded the Nobel Prize in Literature. The committee praised her as an author, quote, who in novels characterized by visionary force and poetic import gives life to an essential aspect of American reality. She was the first black woman of any nationality to win the prize, and in her acceptance speech, Morrison said, We die. That may be the meaning of life, but we do language. That may be the measure of our lives. In 1998, the movie adaptation of Beloved was released. It was directed by Jonathan Demi and co-produced by Oprah Winfrey, who had spent the better part of 10 years working on the screen production. Winfrey also stars as the main character, alongside Danny Glover and Tandy Newton. When first asked if she would consider the story to be made into a movie, she was on the fence about it. It was her sons who encouraged it, telling her that the book would not be changed or lose any of its impact because a movie would be made based on it. She did listen to her sons and agreed to the movie. Unfortunately, the movie flopped at the box office, 
but it most assuredly helped introduce more people to the book, and just like her son suggested, the novel lost none of its impact. She would go on to write six more novels, in addition to seven children's books, with her son, Slade Morrison, as well as poems and plays. No episode about Toni Morrison would be complete without this one final quote. If there is a book that you want to read, but it hasn't been written yet, you must be the one to write it. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed this episode and will spread the word about the podcast. Once again, I have been your host, Jason Nemoa Hardin, and I, along with others involved with creating this podcast, ask that you please consider helping to make this show easier to produce and more frequent by contributing on our Patreon page. Until next time, keep turning those pages. House of Words is written and produced by Crystal M. Sanchez. Narrated and written by me, Jason Nemore Hardin. And music by Creature Nine and Wood. All rights and ownership belong to Crystal M. Sanchez and Jason Nemore Hardin. <laughs>